For someone who has no passion but money driven, <laughs> would you suggest LOB? I would. <laughs> you would? I would. <laughs> <laughs> What's your Why? Answer? Why? I, I, you, I, I wouldn't. I personally think law is hard. There are better ways of making money. Like if you want to be miserable and make money, yes, sure. But also it depends. Do you make it to like the big firms where you Im- eventually rake it in? And you have to serve your time. Serving your time means you must work at least eight to ten years before you actually start making money because you're money driven. Do you really want to go through <laughs> that process with no passion? <laughs> I absolutely would recommend <laughs> it. I think working is hard. Like, realistically, most jobs are, are terrible. Investment bankers are crying. Chartered accountants are crying. Engineers are crying. Doctors are crying. We're yeah. all miserable Everyone's, everywhere. Yeah. So there's no ready real place where it's heaven. Yes. Um, and you're not cutting people open. Law is really not that hard. It's just, it's a, it's a miserable place, but it's not difficult. It's doable if you suck it up and you do it. <laughs> to my channel first of all happy new year i hope you will achieve all your goals that you will be successful and you'll have a prosperous year so for my first video for the year is a legal segment which i haven't done in a very long time and i haven't had a guest on my channel in a long time as well so i'm excited to have goketsu <laughs> for the first time on my channel and as the first guest of the year to answer all your Instagram questions. There's a lot, but before we get into it, I'd like to get her to introduce herself because she is a lawyer. I knew you were going to do that. Why <laughs> didn't you write an intro for me? Um, okay, so I'm Kogetsu. I am an admitted attorney. Um, I don't practice law in a law firm. Um, I run my own consultancy firm and I specialize in construction, energy and infrastructure. You see, the sky's the limit. Yeah, anything. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, guys, all we're going to do today is answer the questions that um, we received on Instagram. There are a lot. We might not get through all of them. We'll try um, answer as many as possible. Some will cut because we think um, at this stage it's probably not necessary to answer them. And perhaps I'll send you an inbox to answer your question directly. Okay. Go ahead, do you want to go first or should I? Uh, please go first. Okay. I am going to answer this one. It says, my cousin is studying LLB at UNISA. I am scared if she can find, I think, a good paying job at a firm or a job in general. I understand the concern. I do. But I do think a lot of LLB students, particularly at UNISA, They focus too much, in fact, just generally, LLB students focus too much on the the normal route that everybody follows. You get your degree, then you do your articles, and then you practice as an attorney, and that's the proper way to do it, and you'll be successful. I think there are many other ways in which you could have a successful career in law. You don't necessarily have to do articles as soon as you, you, you graduate. If you are unable to find articles, You know, you can apply for um, internships, you can do legal graduate programs, or you can study further. So all I'm saying is that the fact that you study at UNISA doesn't mean you're not going to get a job. It's just maybe you're looking like in one direction where there are other options available to you that you haven't thought of exploring. I don't know if you... You want to add to that? I I don't agree. Really? Uh, okay, it's fine. This I is think a conversation. The reality is most Tunisia students don't uh, find jobs uh, after their um, degree. It happens. It's a reality. Most law firms don't prefer people from UNISA. And I think if I was an employer, the one question that I would ask that would differentiate that would make somebody who's, who um, studied at UNISA be exceptional or different is if they worked while they were studying. So if there was a reason why it is that you had to study through UNISA because you had kids and you had to work and um, 
pay for bills. But if you are studying at Geniza for the sake of studying at Geniza part time, I don't. I wouldn't hire you because I don't think that you would make or you'd be able to survive the high pace of a law firm when you're used to not already always having your mind engaged. I agree with that. Yeah. So the UNISA discussion is is multi layered. Yeah, it you have to first ask uh, various questions, and I think I've seen this in in real life with a friend, where they asked. Why did you study at UNISA? Yeah. Because they came straight from high school and they went to, to UNISA and they studied part time. And they want to establish what are the reasons you went to that institution. They don't want to rule you out just because you went to UNISA, but there could be you know, valid reasons why you went to UNISA. It could be that you applied late. It could be that you didn't get entrance anywhere else. It could be that you didn't qualify for other universities. But they need to understand that from the get go, yeah. I think before they even go further with the interview. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Kogeta is very brutally honest. I really am. So, <laughs> I didn't expect her to go in that deep, but I think perhaps you might be helpful. We're not yeah. trying to be negative. I suppose we're just trying to give you the fuller Full picture. picture. Mm. Yeah. So, but there is hope, right? No, so there let's is say, hope, and that's why let's I'm saying that if you're going to study through UNICEF, my advice would be work yeah, yeah, part-time. Yeah. Go be, do an internship for four years as a, as a legal, or, or be an internship, be a legal secretary, get yourself associated with law firms so that by the time you're done with your degree, you have a relationship with a law firm. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Good get so. Choose a question. So my question is, what are the three things you regret not doing during the course of obtaining your LLB? <laughs> so my first one is not doing vacational work. I cannot stress how important back work is. Um, my second one is not fully participating in, I guess, extramural activities. So I just focused on uh, my schooling, which meant that my CV just looked blank, except for my transcript. And the third one is not making a lot of other law friends. <laughs> I think uh, it limits your network once you're out <laughs> of university and you're working. Um, yeah, those are the, the <laughs> three things I regret not doing. I get, I agree with you about back work. Yeah. I only did it once, like when I applied yeah. to Adams and got the job. But Did I you do it in your last year? In my, after my BCom law. So in my third year LLB, okay. but my fourth year of studies. Okay. And people had been doing vacation programs yeah. i just applied late and i only applied to one that's another thing so i think it's it it, it benefits you to get as much experience in that, in that area. area or doing those programs as possible yeah. right so i do agree with that extramural activities i mean i did src that is an extramural that activity. that is right it was just one year though and i also worked part-time so i felt that i couldn't actually do more than i wanted to because of my job mm. um so i don't so that i did cover but I think the one thing I regret when I was studying my LLB, and it has nothing to do with LLB, it has to do with varsity life in general, is like going out more. <laughs> like I'd go to school and go home. Like I was so boring. And I felt like she I was. didn't. <laughs> I didn't get to know people. Like that's the only problem. Like I know, you know, this is, it's the suckiest thing. Like I know people from tax and I'll see them on the street, but. I can't even like have conversations with them because like I know you, but we yeah. never we never had a conversation. I was just that person. But I think it requires a balance, right? Because there are people does, who of course. take partying yes. too far. Too much. Yeah, yeah. I partied. Well, the didn't party, but we drank. <laughs> <laughs> okay, That's next. The next question. Uh, let me see what we have here. I'm in my. I'll be in final year next year, and I'm not sure which electives to take. Okay, there, there are a couple of electives questions. What I would like to say, maybe it's, it's not emphasized enough, is that I don't actually think electives make or break no. like what, how, you, how successful you are in your career, actually. So the first point of departure I would say, right, and if I've contradicted myself before, then this is my stance now, is that choose what you want. I really think like electives are there just so that you get to study an another module that you actually just want to do for yourself that they don't think is that important, doesn't need to be like part of the syllabus. So just do what you want to do. I think that's the first point of departure. But then if you're like, okay, I want to do something that 
is very prominent in the legal field, then it's a different question. But again, it depends which firm do you want to work in because it doesn't help uh, doing, for example, medical law as an elective if that is an elective uh, and then you want to work in an IP firm. So it really, I don't think this is an important question. If you need advice or guidance, it's fine, but I don't think it matters what you choose. I would personally advise people to choose what they want. I'm going to be controversial and say, pick the easiest module. <laughs> um, it will up your average. <laughs> In all honesty, do not try be a hero. Yeah. What matters when you're applying and things is what's on paper, and what's on paper yeah. is a high average. Yeah. Pick the easy modules, pick the easy ones, because the com uh, compulsory ones are not exactly easy. So Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah, that's very good advice, actually. It's not what I did, but it's <laughs> Um, next question. Uh, okay, next one is What careers can one go into with a BCom law degree without doing an LLB degree? I don't know why I chose this, uh, this question. <laughs> <laughs> the options are quite limited. Um, but I do know that there are quite a lot of um, banks that take people with LLB degree, become, um, become law degree. Um, Investec, R&B gives uh, bursaries for uh, become law from first year. So that's something that you can look into. Um, but uh, you wouldn't be doing real legal work once you are... Um, in the workspace, um, the only way that you can do that is with an LLB. But the positive side is that you can get a bursary from two banks. And with that degree, you can get into a bank and do financial stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as she's very right, like, um, I don't know if it's worth studying a BCom law degree on its own. Yeah. I think you're better off just studying an LLB on its own because then you can actually do all the available jobs as a lawyer but become law you might as well study a commerce degree quite honestly that's yeah, my absolutely. that's my um advice if that's where you're going to end it okay yo these questions are all over <laughs> <laughs> um okay there's not enough info about the advocacy route after i write the five exams am i allocated to a firm like prosecutors are allocated or do I apply to firms like CAs do? Okay, okay. There are a couple of things that are a bit um, confused in this yeah. question. So let's unpack it, but in a simple way. Uh, you, As an advocate, before you become an advocate, you have to do your pupillage. And your pupillage you do for a year. Mm -hmm. That's the equivalent of for attorneys' articles. And at the end of that training cycle and after writing the necessary exams, if you pass, you would be qualified as an advocate if you do your pupillage or as an attorney if you do your articles. People at the bar, which are advocates, you can get trained by, so your mentor or the person that you are shadowing, how, what do they it's call them? Yeah, those mentors. Because you need a mentor when you do your pupillage. You could have a mentor in a particular chamber but that doesn't mean you're going to end up practicing as an advocate in that chamber because at some point then you need to interview almost like you interview in law firms as an attorney to be in a particular chamber so that's why I said I get what you're trying to ask but it's a little bit confused it's not it's not they don't call them firms they call them advocacy chambers I think yeah, groups of chambers. groups or chambers so what it is is that during your pupillage you could be in a particular chamber because that's where your mentor is. You could decide that you want to apply to be an advocate who practices in that chamber and that's subject to them accepting you. Or you can apply somewhere else whilst you're completing your pupillage with your mentor and then when you're done, you, you know, you'll be practicing as an advocate at the chamber that you were successful in. I don't know if you want to add. The, I no, don't know a lot about it. What I want to add on, on <coughs> the topic of stuff that aren't spoken enough about, I think 
the, we don't talk enough about the different routes of becoming an attorney or even becoming an advocate, especially an attorney. An attorney, we think you have to go to your LLB, then, then do your articles, then get admitted, and then you practice. But the Act allows people to be practicing advocates or admitted attorneys. Sorry, not practicing advocates, admitted attorneys without even getting an LLB degree. So you'd have to do your articles for five years. So you yes. can approach a law firm fresh out of varsity, ask to do your articles, you do your articles for this five years. This is the LPC Act, the new one. Ooh. There's a new one. <laughs> no, the new Act still says does that. It? Yes, it does, it does yeah. still say that. Yeah, I must be honest. I, I actually, it. I'm lying. I, I also, I take that back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't think it would have done away with it. It wouldn't have. Yeah, traditionally, it you have. could be an attorney by doing articles for five years without <laughs> a degree. And then with a BCom or BA law degree, you do articles for three years without an LLB. And with an no. LLB, two years. Yes. No. No, I don't. No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it was always articles. You had to do articles five years, two years, or one year. No. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll somebody look look it up and comment. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, okay so next question. The next question is my law school results. Can I just tell you guys something that irks me? South Africans using the term law school. We don't have law schools in South Africa. We have universities. In America, <laughs> they're law schools. Um, so I'm going to reread this. My <laughs> university results are above eighty percent average, but I have very bad. I did very bad in high school, as I did science. Will that affect? And I don't see the rest of the questions. And I chose this because I have had personal experience in interviews about my matric certificates. So I don't think that it will impact you for purposes of not having a job, but you must have an answer to explain why is it that your matric results are so bad, because they will ask you. I mean, I was asked that at every single interview for articles, to be an associate, to be even three years after being an associate, mm. because I took maths paper three. And I took maths paper three not because I wanted to take maths paper three, but I took math paper three because I was in the top 10. And this one day I was sitting and talking to my friend in class. I looked up all the top 10 students had their hands up. And I was like, <laughs> I'm taking my Peer hand pressure. <laughs> And then it was math paper three and I got 43%. Oh like no. when I, 43%, an epic fail. They, they asked me about that. Um, they, I get asked, why is it that you have this percentage on your matric certificate? The question that follows is, why did you take um, the subject if you weren't good at it. Yeah. What matters is how you spin the story. And in every interview questions, like don't answer directly, but like that's why we need to practice interview questions. You need to weave out a story that explains everything that kind of makes sense and it's also interesting. So I, in an interview, I tell them about mm. the story about how I was sitting in class chatting away and not paying attention. And then it loosens everybody up. It, we laugh and then we move right on along. That's a good answer. That's a very good answer. Uh, I'm going to answer this one. Are candidate attorneys really overworked and <laughs> underpaid? I can't see the rest of the question. Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, like there's no set answer for this because I, for one, think it depends in the practice area because there are practices that are more busy than others and all candidate attorneys earn the same amount. So you could have a normal eight to five because your practice is not busy. So you're not really overworked, um, but you're getting a good salary. And that's also also dependent on where you work. That's another issue, right? Um, or you could be in a very, very, very busy practice like I know like corporate and commercial uh, practices and litigation or dispute resolution practices are very busy. And those guys work, could work uh, into midnight, uh, past midnight even. And they might feel like they don't get enough money for what it is that they do, right? So I, don't, I, don't, I think it's a tricky question to answer. But in the, in the context of firms that don't pay candidate attorneys enough generally and from the get-go, I think candidate attorneys do a lot of work in general, no matter where you work. And if your compensation is little, then of course you are under underpaid and overworked. Like that's that's the simple short answer to. I to think the rent and law firms pay way enough. They do, they and but the, your kids are spoiled now, eh? 
Hey. International law firms. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's where it is. International law firms, Canada <laughs> attorneys get paid what the top five law firm associates get, get paid. paid. Yeah. So it's yeah. There's no being underpaid. There's there. no being <laughs> don't, yeah, no matter how much you work, even <laughs> So, uh, I'm going to answer one that says, any international legal career prospects with a South African law degree? Absolutely. Um, but not just with the law degree by itself. Um, so, if you want to go into teaching, then you likely have to have a master's and then you can be a teacher's assistant. But if you want to practice and be in law firms, you need to be an admitted attorney. Um, when I was in school, my best friend, not my best, close friend's mom, um, owned a law firm and she one of the things she told us she said an LLB is useless without articles mm. or without pupillage because there's they, 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 there's limited room on what you can do, do with yeah. it so yeah. once you've done your articles and you've been admitted international law firms in your in, in the UK and Australia and New Zealand love South African lawyers. So yeah. the opportunities are completely endless. But it, it also depends on the practice area. Like a person like me who does public law wouldn't be able to go to England. And no, you can't. The only one that you can't do is if you do like delict. So their delict, is our delict is completely different. Is it? Um, but there's less opportunities, right? For people like me, then they are for, uh, for, for, example, for like commercial, like banking and more finance. More commercial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the big laws. ones are banking and finance, M and A, construction, mm. projects, uh, project finance, and leverage finance. Yeah. So if if you are trying to score yourself a, a gig overseas and you want to make it easy for yourself, I would say put up your hand for these yeah. practice areas as a candidate attorney you would be very appealable to the international market. market. Yeah. Um, and if you don't get in um, into those departments, the next best thing is to take a year off, do a master's in that particular field in the UK and just don't come oh, back. TMT, by the way, is also another oh, yeah, big yeah, one. Actually. It's also a big mm -hmm. one for international market. Okay. For someone who has no passion but money-driven, <laughs> would you suggest LLB? I would. <laughs> you would? I would. Ah. <laughs> What's your why? Answer? Why? I, I, you, I wouldn't. I personally think law is hard. There are better ways of making money. Like if you want to be miserable and make money, yes, sure. But also it depends. Do you make it to like the big firms where you Im eventually rake it in? And you have to serve your time. Serving your time means you must work at least eight to ten years before you actually start making money because you're money driven. Do you really want to go through <laughs> that process? With no passion. I absolutely would recommend it. I think working is hard. Like, realistically, most jobs are, are terrible. Investment bankers are crying. Chartered accountants are crying. Engineers are crying. Doctors are crying. We're yeah. all miserable Everyone's, everywhere. Yeah. So there's no really real place where it's heaven. Yes. Um... And you're not cutting people open. Law is really not that hard. It's just, it's a, it's a miserable place, but it's not difficult. It's doable if you suck it up and you do it. And if you do it and you stick around long enough, there's big money in big law firms. Yes. So I would, there I don't big, have a passion for law, money. I'm not going to lie. I think, <laughs> to be honest, most people don't have a passion. Yes. <laughs> Unless you're doing like the public interest stuff, right? The constitutional law stuff. Then you're yeah, maybe, because you want to change the world. But I don't think anyone really, really, I don't really think you, you meet an ordinary lawyer who has a passion yeah. for law. Mm. They, they might like what they do, but passion is, is a very different And I think thing. liking what they do is also influenced by who their boss is. Yeah. Their relationship exactly, with their boss. Exactly, so. exactly. My point is that there's easier ways of making money, personally. <laughs> <laughs> this one says what are the entry requirements and procedures of international law firms i'm going to assume that the question is about international law firms in south africa their requirements are no different than any other law firm it's the same thing llb must have maintained a certain average mm. and you just apply i think the what they're not very good at is marketing themselves to people so they don't always attend career days mm. um let me list the law firms that i it's ellen and ori it's hsf it's white and case, white and case it's baker bacon mckenzie dla piper just went by themselves um 
what's this one? Clyde and Co. Oh, Clyde and Co. Do they, oh yeah, they do count Clyde and Co. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to be on their website Pinsons? and usually there's a lot. Pinson actually. Masons. There's, yeah, actually, there's quite actually quite a, quite a lot. lot. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So you need to go onto their website and check. And usually you have to apply at a global level, um, but it's it's the same requirements. But you have to be an exceptional student. That one, like, I, I don't want to lie to anyone. Babulele Nidi. I've worked at an international <laughs> firm. And I'm uh, not sure about <laughs> But you were an exceptional candidate. No, I'm seeing the people who I saw at candidate attorney right? level. That one is a different story. Uh, I don't. I don't. <laughs> and I think, you know why? Story. Because a lot of people don't know about them. So it's not like the pool that they get is quite big. Uh, Unlike the ENS okay, where everybody cool. wants to be there. So, so there's actually little people they, to choose yeah. from. Okay. Hey, guys, apply internationally. <laughs> Ah, okay. I'm studying at Varsity College, second year LLB. Is it true I won't be admitted as an attorney? <laughs> Who told you that? <laughs> no, it's not true. In fact, I think there's a case from the Concord. But I don't want to get into it because I might not be able to quote it word for word. But as long as you've got an LLB degree, like whether it's from a private institution or from a public institution, you can practice law. I think the first thing that you must do if you're going to apply at a private institution is to contact SACWA and check if their degree is reg- re- SACWA is it re- reg- SACWA recognized? recognized yes yes but I think they are like no, that's I'm, what I'm saying any wherever whoever wherever you're studying the first thing that you must do okay is yeah to just, sure yeah, that your LLB just is SACWA do your due yeah. diligence basically do yeah. your due diligence yeah sure next um Okay, this one we're going to have to answer together. What's the difference between working in-house at a law firm and the Concord... Oh, wait. And the Concord Law Researcher Clock. Okay. Okay. You start. So, working in-house means you're working for a private company as a legal advisor. Mm Mm-hmm. And then when you're working at a law firm, you're either a candidate attorney or a practicing attorney giving advice to clients, which is sometimes the private companies that have in-house legal counsel. Mm -hmm. And then... At Concord, you're just a researcher. Like, you're not practicing as an attorney. You're not a legal advisor. I mean, you could consider yourself one, but not really. You're not not really advising anyone. You're doing research so that, you know, you can eventually come to a judgment for a matter that's being heard in the court. And what a lot of people know, don't know is that um, law clerks or researchers aren't just limited to the constitutional court. Each, yeah. each division or, or each, each court has its own. So you can be a high court clerk, clerk. And you can Supreme be a Supreme Court. court. Um, and even like labor court has researchers. Oh, yes. You know, there's other courts that have uh, law research researcher positions. What are the most important things to include in a cover letter. Okay. I would say the most important thing is you must introduce yourself. Because without introducing yourself in the cover letter, the reader, which is mostly HR, only has your CV, right? And a lot of people have good grades. A lot of people do well. And it's it's like... If you just give me a CV with a person who's performed well and there are like 20 other people who've also performed well, what really, what's the basis in which I choose your CV over the next person? So the cover letter gives you an opportunity to introduce yourself. This is who I am. This is my background. This is why I studied law. This is why I want to, this is what I want to achieve. These are my goals. These are my aspirations. Um, I don't say... I would like to advise students not to be too sobby in their cover letter. It's important to highlight your background, but sometimes people drag it and it might just feel like, hey, maybe now we're trying to feel sorry for this person. People want to give people who deserve the opportunity the opportunity. But I think the, the takeaway from what I'm saying is that make sure that you give us sufficient information about who you are because that's the only place in your application that one gets to read about you and your background and why it is that you want to do law. I have nothing to add. I 
<laughs> I'm not a cover letter person. <laughs> Guys, cover letters are important. I want to really say are. this. At a junior level, yes. Uh, they are very important. People are lazy to do cover letters. Please put time in writing a proper cover letter. This is the best advice I can give on this video, in my personal opinion. Especially if you're in varsity, you're looking for articles, and you're frustrated, maybe go back to the drawing board when it comes to your cover letter, in my personal opinion, over and above the fact that you must perform well. And send it to different people. To, send it to, to different to, people. To give you their views. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Oh, this is so many. I don't even so know. So the question is, how does one <coughs> deal with rejection from law firms? Sometimes it hits home because I can't see the rest of it. Um. <laughs> like Atlahang said, I'm a straight shooter. You just roll with the punches. You keep it moving. You can't take it personally. People get rejected on a regular. Very few law students, um, firstly, very few law students apply to one law firm. So most people apply to multiple law firms. Then some way, somehow, there will be um, a rejection. So my advice is take the moment to cry it out. But move it right on along. It doesn't say anything about you as a person, what your career holds. Like my first um, rejection was from ENS, and then I went on to do my articles there. So, I mean, I cried. But <laughs> <laughs> it was what it is. Just roll with the punches. They have to reject some people. Um, just keep applying. Don't let that um, discourage you from even applying from that same firm the very next year. Just with a better cover letter, a better transcript, something else that you've added onto your CV. I agree with that. But also I wanted to say with rejections, right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of law firms use a system in which applications are, are submitted. Yeah it actually sometimes filters certain, like they have cert, the system might have a requirement, a certain requirements, yeah. and so certain CVs are filtered out because they don't meet the basic requirements those systems have. And that's why you probably get like an automated, am I supposed to say this? I'm not sure what you're talking about, so I don't know. Okay, then it's inside. <laughs> we can't put it in the video. <laughs> I, I learned this from Abdi. People get rejected. <laughs> so you're saying if I have a good CV, so the system will say I only want people with a 70% average, and then it filters everything out. Oh no, but that's fine. You can add that because that it is what it is. You don't, you don't, you, you just don't meet the the requirements. That's I what I mean. saying Sometimes it's a mistake, and then they overlook you because the system says search for the words. You know, some place, some some places where it says search for words like strategic, managerial, and whatever. Oh no, no, so no. So if your CV doesn't, no, say I'm talking that, about like oh, marks. No, that you can say no, must, but most law firms really they state in the application above 675 percent. Oh, okay. Uh, when applying for CA positions, should we shy away from applying at legal aid? No. no. Guys, there's a shortage of jobs in South Africa, and we're not all going to make it. Public in, prosecutor's yeah. office. There's, like, just apply where you get an opportunity to apply. And you can always um, redirect your path at a later stage. But don't sit at home saying, oh, no, I didn't make it into a big five firm or a good firm, so I'm not going to apply to legal aid because I don't know what the reason would be. I think you must seek as many opportunities as are available to you and take the best one. And if you don't have the best, but you have something, why would you not take that opportunity? Yeah. It's better than sitting at home. It's better than honesty. sitting at home. Yeah. Um, this is, the next question is, is it possible? Oh, I've answered this. Um, Can a pupil apply for stipend during pupillage? Uh, yes. Um, but it, so the the it depends on which um, bar council you are. I know the Johannesburg Bar Council; they have their own small little scholarship that they offer to certain people, and then also certain groups of advocates have their own internal one that you need to submit and apply. It's not a lot; it's all less than ten thousand rand, but it's better than nothing. Mm. I'm giving you another opportunity to find another question since well. I gave you that. Talk. No, but that was mine. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've been getting 50s most of my first year modules and second year 
tried to pull up my socks. Uh, I'm currently in my third year and I feel a bit demotivated, but did a bit well on my second year. I think you can always turn it around. I think you might maybe only start worrying if your third year module marks are bad as well um, because you, then you've done bad like most of your um, degree and when you're asked in an interview if you get called for an interview it's, it's going to be very difficult to explain why like why they, should they pick you if there's never been a turnaround in your in your marks I don't know. I think it just yeah. paints a certain picture already from the beginning. So it, it just as long as it's gradual. Yeah. Um, and and going back to Atlahang's uh, explanation about a cover story is that, and what I always say, always weave some story, ex- have a certain explanation as to why things were are uh, or were. Mm, so mm. in your cover letter, you must address why is it that you were able to get 50s in your first year and then show that there was a gradual increase as you applied yourself or you decided that you want to make a, ch- a, a, diff- um, or a change in your academic um, career, but you can't get constant 50s um, and not do anything exceptional and then think you're going to be at a good firm. Yeah, unfortunately. It's, it really is. I actually, I know somebody who got 60s and worked at an international firm, but that was because he was getting 60s because he was putting together this like um, exchange program between South African law, student, law students and the US law students. Like they did this big ass program that mm. managed to get funding. And because he put that in his cover letter, it was like, oh, okay, you you've done this thing. You have, yeah, you have other skills that you're able to use, but mm. it can't just be that you are going to just submit a 50% average transcript without anything. Yeah. Yeah. Ish. Unfortunately. It's, yeah, but also don't give up. It's, it's it really, really, really is possible. I think. Can I give my general advice without um a, a question? question? Yeah. No, and, and I'm answering a question here, which keeps popping up about how people ask, um, how do you go about reading case law? Um, the law degree has a hundred million cases. Mm. There's absolutely no way, unless you are a machine, you'd be able to read all of them and understand them in order to write exams. So what my friends and I did was divide and conquer. Like we literally were just like, the, this module has this amount of cases. There are five, ten of us. You take this ten. You take that ten. You take that ten, and everybody writes a summary, and, and then share. we share amongst themselves. That's a good yeah, method. you really you can't you can't do the law degree and do exceptionally well by yourself unless you are naturally intelligent. Um, but the, the rest, rest, the rest of us who went in law groups like you. <laughs> We read fly notes and head notes. <laughs> I don't understand you people who go ahead with your you could be missing important information. I mean also, if there was no time, like fly notes if you were still alone, studying a, a case before you were writing an exam, I fly notes, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's a reality. So it's, a, it's really study groups are very important for law. Uh you don't try to do it alone. Like, I believe, don't be a hero. Even if you have a, a one friend or two friends, divide and conquer. Pick a module. This is your module. And, yeah. Okay, that's good. Did matric last year, are there job opportunities? In law? No. <laughs> <laughs> you need an LLB. I think in general... Please don't end at matric. If yeah. you can study further, even if you didn't get a bachelor's degree, you know, uh, entrance, just study further. Like, it's not enough. Quite honestly, in South Africa, it's not enough to have a matric. Like, if you want a good life for yourself in future. Of course, you know, there are people who do, like, go into entrepreneurship, start yeah. their own businesses. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about people who they know that they're probably going to be working for a while then a metric is not enough, if we're being honest. But I think also university is not the beginning and end. All it's, not the, the it's not. The FET colleges, uh, the technicons. The one thing, though, I don't believe in is people who go to FET colleges to do social science stuff. Like, you aren't going to get hired in <laughs> HR from an FET college when they can get somebody from HR wow. from, from tax. No, but if you go do electrical engineering, 
they do practicals there, so you are, it's it's beneficial there. But you can't you can't. There's certain things that you really can't do. The FET colleges are meant to be technical uh, for technical okay, skills, sure. so you can't go there. I got you. You otherwise you're just passing time. I think I like agree you, with you. You 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 are not going to. That's why I also uh, my my cousin wanted to do engineering, and I was like, at at tax you're gonna take four years. At this place you're gonna take eighteen months. And then another eighteen months of practicalities, and then you into the job market. Rather do that, yeah, and get it out. Okay, but not social science. Got that. Um, any advice or tips to pass board exams? I think my most important tip is don't try be a hero. Oh There's no yes. need to write all four of them. Oh um, yes, they are a lot of work. Uh, I wrote all four. <laughs> I almost died, um, but I didn't have a choice. It was my last chance, and I had to write all four. But outside of that, don't try to be a hero. Split it. Mm. Um, again, divide and conquer. Group of friends and <laughs> articles. Read some of the stuff. Share notes. Um, but the most important thing is write them two at a time. There's more than enough time yeah. in the two years for you to be okay, even if you fail. That's very true. Yeah. Don't be a hero. Don't. Okay. Okay, this one is a bit long. I'm current, currently a compliance graduate in a big telecom. I did an LLB and want to get articles. Would my current experience assist in being a more fa- favorable candidate? Or law firms only consider what you did in varsity in terms of VAC work? Okay, uh, let me leave out the last part. I definitely think you being a compliance graduate and having experience in that um, area assists you in, um, actually it it sets you apart from like an ordinary LLB graduate because you've got working experience. You should definitely, if you wanna uh, do your articles, you should definitely pursue that. In fact, most people who decide, okay, I'm gonna go the compliance route after doing my LLB, actually later on decide, actually I should have done my articles first. So there's nothing wrong in changing direction at that stage. You can definitely apply, and I think it actually gives you a bit of an edge over other ordinary LLB graduates because you've got that work experience. Mm. Anything to add? Nothing? Okay. I do think it'll make them stand out. Yeah, yeah. Um, Even during general articles, they will be able to apply their minds much better than somebody fresh out of varsity. Um, which one is better between attorneys and advocates? In terms of what? <laughs> Personality, <laughs> money. <laughs> Workload. Yeah, so I think, so from what I've heard, I have friends who are advocates and I were, when I was an attorney. Um, at a junior level, the workload is the same um, because they also have to answer to senior counsel. Mm. Um, so it it's it's it really is. I think a lot of people before you go go into law, just know that law is hard. It's not meant to be. It's not Quite easy on honestly. anyone. It really is a miserable, sometimes rewarding um, experience. Um, but once they get out, so once the, the so once we get out of a junior level, um, the differentiator between advocates and attorneys is money. Okay, advocates make a lot of money. They do. They really, really That's do. That's because they don't share. Make a lot of money. What so we they, get a salary. They yeah. plug in per hour that they work. Yeah. I think the biggest mistake that a lot of junior advocates make is that they think that every single cent that comes to your account is theirs. 40% belongs to SARS. Mm. So don't yes. make the mistake that's, that's of spending mistake, right? all of it. But from a mid-level advocates, we make more money. At senior level, they, it, it gets ridiculous. In the UK, it's the other way around. Barristers don't make a lot of money and then solicitors make a lot of money. But in South Africa, the money is with advocates. <laughs> the money is with advocates. That's where the money resides. It really we can is take more in that <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> but it's a, it's a lonely life, though, because you don't have teams. You don't have people to really bounce ideas off of everything. If you're a senior, the back stops with you. Yeah, um, that's true. But yeah. Okay, advice for someone who will be doing law first year. Um, Don't have too much fun. The problem with first year students in general is that they finish matric and because they were always 
in the strict environment where they, all these rules apply, they get into varsity and they want to be too free. And then some of you can't actually handle the mm. independence that comes with being uh, a varsity student. And so you go back and then you forget about your studies. And then at some point, you find yourselves in the exclusionary <laughs> board, what, what, where now they must, they must consider your application uh, on whether or not they should exclude you for poor performance or give you another chance. So in general, to law, first year law students, just or just students in general, first years, please focus on the books. Um, yes, you will be independent, but you need to have self-discipline. Um, for law students specifically, read like you can't shy away from reading law is about reading so if there's case law that's prescribed start reading it if there's material that they give you in class and they say prepare for the next class just do it because then you're building the habit of um easily being able to consume a lot of uh information and documentation um and that will help you especially when you start working because it never stops Here's a question for you. For me? Yeah. What is the best legal writing CAs can submit for the Concord clerkship application? I don't even know what that is. Uh, I don't know. I understand the question. I don't think I understand it. <laughs> but I think they're talking about the written piece that needs to be submitted mm. with the application. So usually, because there's so many applications that go to the Concord um, and there are so many written pieces that have to be read. It's more for the person who's going to read your application. I think you would want your written piece to stand out by maybe choosing a subject area that's probably very well spoken of. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's very topical at the at the current moment. So everyone is discussing it, or you know, people are trying to find. Uh, various answers or solutions to that particular problem. So if you uh, chose a topic in, that, in line with that, if you've written an article that's been published, that's something that you can also submit. But think out of the box. Don't submit uh, short assignments that you did during your degree. That means that, means that you can't think um, for yourself. You have to have somebody ask you a question. You can't go and find a problem that you're going to answer for yourself. So I think... Just try to think out the box. Be creative. Think about something that's topical. But also, um, don't be lazy. You're going to have to do reading to actually write that written piece. I think there's no easy way out of it. It requires you to do some research because what they're trying to establish with that written piece is that you will be able to fulfill your job function as a law researcher. So that piece must give that reader the, 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 the confidence that you are able to do research. And then another one for you. <laughs> what is Aye. the daily life of a lawyer like? <laughs> I answered this on Instagram. I did. But answer it with for you too. With a meme. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, it's hard, hey? Like, it's hard. All I can say is it's hard. But besides it being hard, I think you work, like... It depends, again, on which department you work in, but you're going to go to the office if you are required to go into the office. You're going to be grafting. You're going to be working the whole day. You might work past 8 o'clock at night. Sometimes you might work into midnight. It might be two out of five days. It could be the whole week. You might have chilled weeks. You might have very busy weeks. It's up and down, but I think the general the, the general notion about law is that it's, it's, it's very busy and people are always working. I don't, there is a work-life balance if you create it for yourself. Otherwise, a lot of people just get engulfed in work and that's all they do. But on a daily, we're always working. I don't, uh, there's nothing else to say. Like, we're, like we're always working. That's it. <laughs> I don't know if you have anything to, you are a lawyer yourself. <laughs> but I'm not only working. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that's because she runs her own consultancy. <laughs> And there's not always work, which also means there's not always money. Yeah, yeah. Um. But doesn't it depend on which level you're on? Well, well, did you find that your experience as an article clerk was different from your experience as an associate? Definitely, yes, you're right. Mm. So, But again, it depends on the department, right? Mm. So because I was doing trademarks, it was a little bit more chilled than people who were like in RAF, for example. RAF people, people in disputes in general, were always at the office uh, late into the 
the, the night. Whereas I'd leave around five, six, unless it was like a really um, urgent matter or something that was, a hearing was, was coming very closely. Then I'd be at the office until like eight. But in trademarks, past 8 p.m., hardly. <laughs> Do you understand? And that was like here and there. Very few incidences where I could recall where I was at the office late at night as a candidate attorney, but that was because of the practice area. So again, my experience was different solely because of in the area I practiced. Mm -hmm. Not really because I was a candidate attorney. I was at ENS and we left at midnight Easy. every day. <laughs> every day we left after midnight every day. But that doesn't happen nowadays, yes? Because construction department is no longer oh. there. <laughs> we literally, our boss used to allow us to come after eight. Because wow. we used to leave after midnight. That's hectic. Um, but don't be scared. It's much better now. Because you can work from home. Yeah. So it's fine. Um, I don't know if we're going to answer any more questions. I think Let's see if we can do one, one, one each and then we're done. And then we'll try, I'll try to answer everybody else on, on, on Instagram. I can't see what, what's an important question here? Okay. Don't know what. Oh, I have one. Does everything you do now make sense? Do you really, do you actually feel like everything you, you studied has prepared you for, where do I see the next part of it? For the... Or oh, the work you do, no. So it doesn't make sense. No, nothing we studied <laughs> prepared me for for articles or for being an associate. Absolutely zero. I think the only thing was to sure. read and pay attention. But the actual essence of it, um, what they teach is is my old boss used to be like. They, they tell you what the law is about, but they don't tell you what the law is. All they yeah. teach you is where to find the law. That's but what happens true. in real life, day to day, there is... I mean, even the way we write opinions. So the mem way you write a memo and opinion in, in, in university is quite different to the way you'd write it because the way you'd write it in real life is according to how your boss wants it to be written. Um, yeah. Does everything make sense? No. No. <laughs> We're winging it every day. <laughs> every day. You just hope to survive wow. until the next day. Yeah. No, it's true. <laughs> Is it possible to eventually make it into the big five if you did your CA elsewhere, like legal aid? And I think there was another question that said, how can you move from a small firm to a big to firm? Big I think it's possible. I've seen it. Yeah. I don't know about legal aid, but I've seen somebody who's moved from a small firm. Um, There's quite a lot, a actually, yeah. of people who move from small firms to big firms. Yeah. Especially if you do, a, if, if you stay at that long, 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 a long small period. firm for a long period of yeah. time, which shows consistency. And I think what big law firms appreciate is that the people in the medium-sized firms and in the small law firms get their hands dirty quite... They get trained. Um, yeah, quite yeah. well. So they get to be able to run matters by themselves, which isn't which um, their peer at a big firm wouldn't be at that level. So it's very possible to do the move. Mm, I'll, just, um, I'll just add to that to say that I definitely think it depends on the practice area. If you're doing M&A in a small firm, it really depends on the size of the transactions that you're doing yeah. because in the big firms, they do like very sizable transactions and they almost feel like if it's a small size transaction, then the complexity of the matter wouldn't have given you the necessary skill or development. Whereas if you're doing disputes, for example, because disputes is going to court, running matters, you you always be working late, then I think it's sort of easier to move from a small firm or a medium-sized firm. There are other areas of law that you can But you move. don't think with m and I mean, the <coughs> average junior in an m and transaction is doing CP, where over the years it's a Maybe big I'm value. Wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. It's a big value, but maybe I'm the wrong. level of your involvement <laughs> is so small, whereas opposed to somebody who ran a whole small transaction by themselves. You're right. I think you can spin it. it it's really that's the term I was looking you for can when spin I said it. read the story. <laughs> Learn how to spin everything. Like it will make you 
I interview quite well, and I only interview quite well because I spin. Things. <laughs> like I will spin anything, <laughs> everything. I've moved around law firms, and my answers is to moving. I will present this beautiful story. Learn how to spin, guys. Yeah, learn how you to spin. You with the 50% in first year, spin that. Yeah. Like, literally, I don't think it, like your position means that that's where it ends. Yeah. Quite honestly, like, the world is still your oyster. You just need to find ways in which you can get in. And, and that's why I started my mentorship program. Uh, this is the last question. Because somebody mm-hmm. asked, what is my mentorship program about? Like, what am I trying to achieve with it? So... First of all, I'm focusing on third and fourth year students for a reason because they are all, they're like in their penultimate and final years of studies and they, they need to sort of position themselves to start working uh, in, a very, in a very short space of time. Many of them actually don't have job opportunities yet and they might be messing up their applications either because they don't have pro- appropriate cover letters or CVs or they just haven't been given the necessary direction and... That's what I'm trying to do with my mentorship. I'm not necessarily saying I am not going to accept uh, people who've already secured deals, but I don't see why I need to mentor you because you're okay. I think you're okay. You'll be fine. And most firms do have some sort of mentorship um, program within the firm when you start. So, But I'm looking for guys who are really struggling to either study, um, get good applications out, get vacation work, they don't really know what they're doing or what's going to happen at the end of their studies so that they have sort of like a direction and they have a better chance at also being successful one day in their career. Woo-hoo. And Esther will be one of our mentors. Who's Men- Esther? Oh, sorry. Good guess. <laughs> She'll be one of the mentors at some point because she's done a lot. I know like today was answering your guys' questions, but she does have an impressive CV and I think she'll be a great mentor. She promised me my own interview. Yeah, she'll she'll be back. <laughs> she'll be back. <laughs> okay, guys, that's it for today. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Hope it was useful. If you have any other questions that you want to ask, you can leave it in the comment section and uh, we'll try to answer them. Or you can DM us on Instagram or on LinkedIn. Um, I don't know if she ha- has... My Instagram handle is Mother of Rainbows. Yes, Mother of Rainbows. But LinkedIn... Do you have LinkedIn? My LinkedIn is my name, Gwagetso <laughs> Okay, sure. <laughs> and then I'm at Lachan Kufuza everywhere. So that's it, guys. Cheers. Bye. Bye. <laughs>